Zugma, you know it, but do you really know it? Today we'll tell you what it means, how to use it, and why it isn't solepsis. At the Quintilian Institute of Words About Words, we pride ourselves on rediscovering ancient and interesting terminology for the terminology that we use every day. And while our highly expert and well-remunerated researchers were probing the archives, they stumbled on an interesting set of rediscoveries. First, of course, they unearthed the word zugma, and when they did, they found that it was tangled up with a bunch of other morphologically related terms. And second, they stumbled into a raging controversy about the meaning of the word zugma and its relationship to the term solepsis. So today I'd like to report on both findings, introducing you to the term zugma and to its various complications. It's going to be a rousing venture, to say the least. And I really see no reason to loiter, so let's proceed. Now zugma gets a lot of credit that it doesn't quite deserve, and it's a shame because zugma is plenty interesting enough on its own without taking credit for another word's achievements. But to keep it simple, zugma is a name given to the stylistic phenomenon whereby one word, usually a verb, governs a whole series of sentence parts. So for example, if you had a sentence like this, Hesifi has its rivers, Olinda has its hills, you could work some zug magic on it and come up with something like Hesifi has its rivers, Olinda its hills. In this second case, the verb has gets used only once, but it applies to the second part of the sentence as well. This, in its most basic form, is zugma, and as other commentators have pointed out, it can work even for sentences with longer series in them. So even something like Rosa demanded their attention, their admiration, and their loyalty works on the basic idea that zugma allows one verb to be in charge of successive phrases without being repeated itself. But wait, I can hear some of you typing already. Isn't zugma something more specific, something that only works in pairs and requires some kind of a pun? Well, if you've run into that highly specialized definition of zugma, the short answer is no, not really. But when have logophiles ever been in it for the short answer? So for those of us who haven't been offended yet, here's what's going on. Zugma has been getting credit for something that solepsis is meant to do. You see, many people are taught that zugma is a special case whereby one verb applies to two phrases but in different ways. For example, in José dropped the cake and the ball that day, dropped applies to cake literally, but to ball figuratively. He didn't actually drop a ball, he just fouled up real bad, and yes, I did just say a zugma. But anyway, dear friends, the point here is that when we do allow zugma to have a broader meaning, this sentence becomes a case of solepsis. You see, solepsis necessarily requires a mismatch between the verb and the parts that it governs, while zugma does not. So historically, solepsis refers to cases where the verb doesn't apply to both of the parts that it governs, but is used anyway. For example, the cookies and the ice cream was delicious. Obviously, was works for ice cream, but it doesn't work for cookies. Or we ate milk and cookies. Again, one doesn't really eat milk, but you get the idea. Rhetorically, solepsis also refers to cases where a verb seems to mean two things because it applies to the two parts that it governs in different ways. So you could have José dropped the cake and the ball that day, or they cut down her orchard and her future. And in the opinion of some commentators, including the Quintilian Institute, these are classic cases of solepsis, even though many people would call them instances of zugma. That is, solepsis is a more specialized term that requires a mismatch between the verb and the parts that it applies to, while zugma is a broader term that can be used to refer to any series of sentence parts that are governed by a single, unrepeated verb. Of course, now you might be wondering why the Quintilian Institute would adopt the position that zugma isn't what most people seem to agree it is, and that's a fair question. The primary reason is that zugma doesn't come alone. There are three variations of zugma, and as other researchers not associated with the Institute have pointed out, those sub-variations of zugma seem to operate more like our broader definition than like the narrower solepsis. So when our teams rediscovered the word zugma, they also rediscovered the terms prozugma, mesozugma, and hypozugma, all variations of zugma which describe different placements for that unrepeated verb. Now I could make up my own examples of these three subspecies of zugma in order to show you that anyone can do it, but I'm also building an argument here, so I'll be borrowing my next examples from Putnam's work The Art of English Poesy in order to show you the evidence that our conclusions are based on. Prozugma refers to an instance of zugma where the unrepeated verb comes before the series that it governs. And Putnam offers this example. 
Her beauty pierced mine eye, her speech, mine woeful heart, her presence, all the powers of my discourse. In this instance, since prozugma is definitely a case of zugma, we see pierced being applied to all three parts without being repeated. Importantly, pierced means the same thing in all three cases. There is no shift in meaning or grammatical mismatch, so we can't call this solepsis, and we end up putting a point on the board for a broader definition of zugma. Mesozugma then refers to a zugma where the unrepeated verb happens somewhere in the middle. Again, from Putnam, fair maid's beauty, alack, with years it wears away, and with weather, and sickness, and sorrow, as they say. Of course, this isn't something anyone would probably write today, but it continues to illustrate the point. Here, wears away happens somewhere in the middle, applies to more than two parts of the sentence, and maintains a consistent meaning throughout. It's a kind of zugma, but again, it doesn't match the narrow requirements of solepsis. And finally, hypozugma, perhaps unsurprisingly, comes in at the end, and Putnam offers this example. My mates that want to keep me company, and my neighbors who dwelt next to my wall, in my quarrel they are fled from me all. Mates and neighbors are both fled, and both literally. If this is a type of zugma, then shifting meanings cannot be a necessary requirement for zugma. Okay, but I've been going on for long enough. The short of it is this. Zugma is a word about words referring to the wonderful and exciting possibility of a single verb applying to multiple parts of a sentence. Zugma is also a broad and general term for any instance of that phenomenon, no matter how many parts of the sentence there are or where in the sentence that verb in charge shows up. And zugma comes in many flavors, prozugma, mesozugma, and hypozugma for verbs that happen at the beginning, somewhere in the middle, or at the end, respectively. Often, zugma gets the credit for the work of solepsis, and of course, when you're dealing with words as old as these, there are bound to be shifts in meaning over time. So I'm not really saying that people who call solepsis zugma are wrong, but I am saying that there's compelling evidence to understand zugma in a broader way than is the custom. At any rate, though, if you do see someone calling solepsis zugma, there's no need to make a fuss about it. Just smile to yourself and be grateful for your own good fortune. And, as is our custom, the Quintilian Institute is always eager to collect more samples of these words about words, so please consider donating to our cause by writing your best zugma or solepsis in the comments below. And of course, if you'd like to support the Institute on an ongoing basis, we'd be grateful for your subscription. You give your support, and we are unending gratitude. And indeed, thank you for watching. I mean, we just picked a fight with a lot of Zugma fans, so yeah, I do think we should make sure the doors are locked. <laughs>